Uh, I'm Brian Douglas. Uh, I go by B-Dougie on GitHub, B-Dougie-Yo on the Twitter, as well as Instagram. I've been taking a lot of pictures here. I know you guys have probably all seen it all, but uh, follow me on the gram. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, improving GitHub's developer experience with GraphQL. Uh, we had a couple, we had a GraphQL talk by Nick, who's sitting on the front earlier today. It was more about internally and how we build GraphQL and how we're using it internally. Uh, I'm going to talk more about the external experience. So as developers, and especially as developers at API conference, there's a good chance you're probably using GitHub. There's a good chance that you could probably improve your workflow on GitHub by using some of the tools I'll talk about in a moment. So hopefully a lot of this is new for you. If you're an expert, uh, please sit through. I've got a lot of awesome, amazing slides that you would love to see. Um, I also have this slide here because my other title was really long. Uh, I would actually prefer to call this talk sampling GraphQL, but it, at the time that I said I would give this talk and submitted this, I had a broad, like I'm still talking about the same thing as the first slide, but you can kind of summarize sampling Graph, GraphQL, and that's what my talk's gonna be, at, be about. And um, I mentioned sampling. So I'm a big hip hop head, uh, I like rap. Uh, I'm from the US, um, and that's a thing that we do there, we listen to rap. It's also a thing that you guys do here in, in France, especially Paris. Um, I don't know if you guys knew this, I don't know how into hip hop you are, but hip hop is as old as it is in the US as it is in France. Um, if you didn't know that, it actually got started here in Paris um, in the late 70s, around the time that this Netflix, Netflix show actually um, is based on. So do you guys have the show on your Netflix in Paris called The Get Down? It's a really good show. It's since been canceled. Uh, I'm not upset, I'm just angry. Uh, but it was a great show. Uh, it was a great show because it talks about how, how hip-hop kind of started. Uh, hip-hop actually came from the, the time where um, disco. So disco, we're all familiar with disco. Disco is the music that we had uh, mainly on the East Coast uh, um, of the US where it was like more of like ABBA and like Dancing Queen and all this other stuff. And uh, it got to the point where disco was kind of getting to the point where it's kind of getting dead and was kind of getting aged out. And what was happening was a movement in, um, in the northern part of the Bronx in New York uh, where people would actually take different tracks from disco and create this new, this new hippity hoppity thing called rap or hip hop rather. Uh, and one of the biggest groups, and again, the get down is actually based on the establishment of this group, but also new groups starting around that. So all these hip hop groups. Uh, this group's called Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. So Grandmaster Flash, he is pretty prominent in the hip hop culture. He kind of brought another, a bunch of other people. I promise you this is all gonna tie in the GraphQL. Just give me five more slides. So, <laughs> so Grandmaster Flash, he brought all these other people up uh, and showed them, showed them how to sample from disco tracks and use turntables and then create uh, what essentially what they call is to get down uh, once the beat uh, we call it like the beat being dropped. Uh, that was like the most, uh, anyway, that was not very hip hop of me to say it that way. But I bring this up because there's a song that, it got really popular again uh, when I was coming of age through grade school and high school called The Message. And this song is, uh, a lot of you probably heard the hook of the song, but you probably don't know what the song, like the actual verse. Uh, the verse itself is like, my brother's doing fast at my mother's TV, so he's watching too much. It's just not healthy. So it's like the, uh, it was the age of the, when the rap is like, and the chicken tastes like wood. Like every rap song sounded just like that. But this song was a little different. Oh, uh, sorry, the, the hook for this is, don't push me because I'm close to the edge. So that's the, that's the song, everybody, I'm trying not to lose my head. Um, what's that, Happy Feet? Happy Feet, it was a, animated movie that was like the sort of the, the uh, pop song that was in there. Uh, but the message was, it was a transition from disco, but also from um, hotels, holiday inns, uh, motels, like all, that, all the fun rap, it became social commentary. Uh, so rap became less of like, oh, this is a really cool thing, we're just gonna get down, we're gonna party, and then it became, actually there's serious stuff happening in our neighborhoods that we're gonna talk about. And um, like you guys are very much in the revolutions here. Um, we just, I just can't, I flew in on Sunday. There's like something happening outside on, that's breaking windows, I'm not sure what it is. It's like, it must be a lot of like hardcore parties. I'm not sure. I, I don't speak French, so I'm not really sure what's on the news. I'm really just kidding. I know exactly what's happening. But so social commentary, that's, uh, I think that's actually part of the reason why hip hop took off so much in France, because France, um, or sorry, Paris specifically, you know, you guys go through your, your waves and your cycles through political reasons and whatnot. But um, I, find that, I find the correlation, so hopefully you guys appreciate that. But when I say social commentary, I mean, really mean gangster rap too. So from the late 70s, we kind of migrated really quickly into gangster rap towards the mid to late 80s. Um, a lot of us are familiar with the Straight Outta Compton movie. Um, it kind of 
blew up in the box office. Also Public Enemy, so Flava Flav and uh, Easy E, all those uh, hardcore gangster rappers, they, they created a brand around this, and it's a lot of the brand that like literally we're still wearing nowadays. It's sort of a cycle. Uh, and I think hip hop is cyclical, and I also think that tech is also cyclical too, is for, for reasons which we'll get to in two slides. Um, so then I, I migrate further into past the 80s, into the 90s, and we had this guy, his name's Tupac, and Tupac was great, because not only was he very educated, uh, despite him being a gangster rapper, he was educated in the top schools. He actually was an actor before he was a rapper. Uh, he was actually in a Chevy Chase movie, uh, with and he appeared uh, with the group Digital Underground, uh, which was another hip-hop group coming through in the 90s. Um, but he transformed what, what rap was once again during the gangster rap era. Uh, and he had a song that was called, Ain't Not the, uh, the song was called Two of America's Most Wanted. It was with Snoop Dogg. Uh, but the hook of that song is Ain't Nothing But a Gangster's Party. You guys familiar with that song or am I just like embarrassing myself right now? All right, so yeah, hopefully that uh, transcended, uh, sorry, transcended over the, the pond. But um, this all went down in 1996. And this was actually the same year that that album and song was big, it was the same year Tupac was actually unfortunately shot and killed uh, in Las Vegas. And I went through all those slides and I promise you this is all is gonna connect because 1996 is the same year we got the spec for REST. So <laughs> REST API came out in 1996. <laughs> Thank you. And that's the end of my talk. <laughs> no, but uh, in all seriousness, uh, we did get REST. And that was a big, that was a big time. Uh, we actually didn't start using REST till four years later in 2000. Um, I, f I already forgot the guy's name. Actually, Roy Fielding, it's in my notes right here. Roy Fielding uh, was in some college and uh, had some sort of spec and a white paper. And thanks to him, we're now using REST and we've sort of deleted every single other way of interacting with APIs. Hopefully you haven't. Like, there's other valid ways to do this, but REST is the best. So I went through all this. I just wanted to throw out here, I work for a company called GitHub. Raise your hand if you use GitHub. Okay, you've heard of it, cool. So I don't have to explain what we are, but I'll still explain what we are. So we're a small incubator inside of Microsoft. Uh, so we're just, we're just getting started. It's a small startup inside of there, um, working on very niche Git tools. Um, my name is Brian Douglas, I had mentioned it before, I'm a developer advocate, so I do this a lot. Uh, that's why I've, I really worked on that intro. I'm really proud of that, to be honest. Uh, uh, um, Brian Douglas Money Sign, that's my rap name on Twitter. Uh, and again, B-Duggy is what I call myself on GitHub. Um, but the question a lot of people ask me is what a developer advocate is. Uh, developer advocate is, well, it's everybody. Like if you're gonna go back to your, your team and you're advocating on better experiences and improving the experience of how you guys interact with APIs, you're advocating. At GitHub, majority of our, our company are engineers. So we tend to have a lot of engineers, including in this conference. Uh, two other besides myself are all engineers on our um, different various teams at GitHub, uh, and they advocate. Um, the difference between them and me is that I'm the Beyonce of GitHub, so I like to call myself Queen B, uh, and not because I'm full of myself. I mean, I am. Who isn't? I'm pretty conceited. <laughs> she has this thing called the Beehive, so it's her super fan group. Uh, GitHub has 31 million developers. Uh, we have like. I don't want to say we own the market, but we have a lot of people who are using our product. So we have a lot of people we have to listen to. So as a developer advocate, I get to listen to your complaints. You can tweet me. I'll listen. I can't promise uh, that anything will happen, but I, I've opened a lot of issues based on Twitter conversations and interactions at conferences. So that's why I call myself Queen B, because I'm here. Uh, and I constantly ask myself, what would Bay do? Um, Bay, she constantly is always getting people. She actually has a new uh, mentorship program where she's uh, growing up and coming artists. Um, and you should definitely check that out if you're interested. There's uh, only a couple handful of artists she's actually sort of brought up so far. Uh, but what she really does is she goes to bat for the hive. And as I mentioned, the 31 million developers, including everybody in this room, I'm here to hear, um, hear your complaints, but also hear your wins and what you want to talk about. Um, so I'm actually going to talk about the GraphQL API. Um, and again, I'm going to talk about how you can use it, not how we built it. Um, that's sort of my focus. But I do want to point out that GitHub chose GraphQL uh, mainly to solve, and I won't sort of hark on this too much because Nick, Nick actually had a great talk that explained a lot of why we did this. Um, but I think the two key points that were explained this morning is that GitHub wanted to pro provide more flexibility to our integrators. So anybody using our API, uh, more than likely you have an opportunity, or you're probably already using it either through Travis, like once you log in with Travis, you're interacting with our API, um, either directly or indirectly because you didn't write the code for Travis. Actually, anybody work at Travis here? Oh, sweet, so many. All right, so um, 
Yeah, so we're really we're really focused into improving the experience, like having a REST API for 10 years, uh, now 10 plus at this point. Um, there's a lot of things that have changed and a lot of reasons that things were getting a little crufty and we had to make a, little, a lot of hard decisions on what to do in the future. Um, so we found that GraphQL kind of solved a lot of those issues. And I only bring this up because also a, a line who um, spoke just upstairs just the previous session uh, talked about GitHub Actions. We had launched GitHub Actions, uh, I guess now two months ago. And this is really around solving way more problems and give you way more tools. GitHub's really in the business, not of trying to own the way you, you ship, ship code. Like we have good ideas, we use GitHub to build GitHub, uh, but our, really, our goal is actually to get out of the way. So we want you to use GitHub, but we also want to get out of the way so you can continue to ship code the way you want to ship code. Um, there's, always, there's always situations and instances where you think GitHub could be better, uh, and we'd love to ship all those features, but we also have to keep in mind of the entire hive of how that affects everybody, so there's a good chance that there's a, a way in the next couple slides where you can actually solve some of your solutions. And when I talk about these solutions, I'm talking about those hooks, so the flexibility and for integrators, and those are, I like to call it interactions for our web hooks or our interactions with hooks. And I personally don't think, I couldn't think of anybody better to talk about hooks than Puff Daddy. So I mentioned this briefly, Puff Daddy, he, um, he kind of changed the rap game once again. So in 1997, uh, Puff Daddy actually took a song from The Police, which is Every Breath You Take, and he actually sampled that song to create a song that kind of changed rap going forward. Uh, and it was, a, it was a song in response to um, Notorious B.I.G. He actually got shot a year later. There's a whole East Coast, West Coast thing going on, um, basically East Coast, West Coast of the U.S., uh, where uh, gangster rap, they were like literally gangsters, and they would like shoot each other based on, you know, what lyrics you were rapping about or what colors you, you basically wore. So not the best situation, not the best time. I'm not trying to glamorize that. I just want to make a point that at that point, when Tupac died and when Notorious B.I.G. died, um, Geeks of Rap kind of died with them. And people kind of were like, what are we doing here? This is probably not the best thing. So literally the year after REST was launched, um, Geeks of Rap changed as well, which there's a correlation, I'll get to that in a sec. Um, but not only that changed, that rap changed. So no longer it was about how gangster you were, it was about how fly you were. So we had like the return of patent leather, which was like a thing in the 70s. It came back, this little baggier for some reason. And it seemed like every single rapper out there had a fisheye lens and some sort of weird uh, latex looking suits. Um, and I think the best part of this about this time in rap is that it brought back Fresh Prince. So Will Smith came back and got jiggy with it. And I think because it was so inviting, we saw a lot of different changes in rap and rap became way more approachable for this the broader audience. And I think that was kind of what REST did for our APIs. And I think that's what GraphQL is gonna be doing for us in the future as well. So fast forward to 2016, GitHub sampled GraphQL. We took something that we thought was really cool and we sampled it into our product. Um, I did go through a way more introduction. Uh, I actually talked to our director, uh, our senior director of ecosystem. Uh, currently, at the time, he was like a senior, he was just a manager, uh, but he had just finished launching, basically launching the, the prototype of GraphQL into GitHub uh, and then publicly talked about it. I actually had him on my podcast. So if, you, if you're interested in hearing that story from another take, uh, definitely check out this podcast called Jamstack Radio, episode number five. But the cool thing about this is one year later, GitHub publicly launched GraphQL. So we decided based on the experience that we had internal as a, a private beta um, we actually decided, hey, this is a thing that we want to do. We have lots of developers, and I, we think that this GraphQL thing is going to help solve a lot of problems that our developers have. So problems including like rate limiting, caching, like all those things we kind of got for free, but also we were able to solve them with a different twist. So we were the approach to problem, uh, slightly different than we were doing years uh, prior. And as Nick mentioned earlier in his talk too, there was a lot of inconsistency with our current REST API. Uh, so there are problems that we had, uh, there's like this uh, certain thing like where you have certain data that you expect to be returned. So like if you have a date form, uh, I don't want like say re repositories, you would expect the same sort of date form on issues. This is not an actual, I'm just making this up on top of my head because I didn't have an example. But there's inconsistency to how the date's being returned to you. It's inconsistency on like whether or not the, the writer or the owner of this issue is also attached to the owner of the repo. Uh, so there's not a correlation between that. And those are things that we had to constantly have to fix as time went by. And this is like a natural progression of any long standing product. Like the best thing that I like to do in my role is I get to ship code really fast and walk away and never deal with it ever again. So I, I ship a lot of side projects and I kind of, I feel good about myself, but I never have to support them. Well, we don't do that at GitHub. We support stuff and we look to support it for a long time. We want to make a lot of people happy, uh, make the masses happy. 
so we have to follow up with that. So I think one of the best things about the with GraphQL is that you get a lot of documentation for free because it's built along with your schema. Um, historically, I had a lot of exam a lot of interactions with GitHub's API in general because I worked for a lot of start uh, San Francisco based startups that integrated with GitHub. So I was a consumer of the API. And the best part about it is, is I never ha actually had to read the documentation. Um, the documentation as of today consists of mainly reference material. So if you know what you're looking for, it's very easy to find what you need. But if you never heard of like a contents attachment API, because it only came out like last week, um, then you don't know what to look for. You don't know that it exists. I had a couple of different projects where I had to discover things by just asking the person next to me, which not everybody has someone next to them to ask about, hey, I want to do this problem. How do I solve it? So with GraphQL, we came out with this thing called the GraphQL Explorer, um, which who's seen this before, the GraphQL Explorer? Who's used it? Okay, so it's on our developer guides. But really quickly, if you wanted to test GraphQL and you'd only just sat through all these tracks and you don't have any sort of GraphQL to do or you don't have a long weekend to create your own GraphQL server, though you can actually do it pretty quickly with Amplify or Prisma. Um, just throwing that out there. Um, you could actually test live data and production code based on your GitHub account. So your GitHub account, you just log in access and you can start searching GraphQL queries and sort of wrap your head around why this might be a good way of approaching uh, consuming APIs. And the great thing is that you can write your query, you can write your data, or you can receive data in JSON, as well as see documentation directly uh, in, in the, uh, the browser. So I personally, uh, I've only been working at GitHub since February, but I've, again, I've been using GitHub API for a very long time. And when they launched the GraphQL API, I wanted something to um, actually test out GraphQL myself. Um, so I am going to pour some water real quick. You can edit this out. And I only have one hand, so I'll use all cups. Cool. So I wanted to try GraphQL myself. And the way I did it is I thought of an idea. So GitHub is a place for open source. Do you guys know that? There's a lot of open source happens on there. And I always wanted to get involved in open source. So I was always blocked, though, because every time I wanted to get involved in open source, I would, <coughs> wow, I would find the project, but then I would never know where to start. So I'd find a project. And then like two weekends later, I'd be like, oh, I should do some open source, I have time. But I'd never remember what to do or where I found that project. So I, had, I needed a, a tool to basically save ideas for where I can contribute. Uh, and I could sort of, it was like a CRM basically for open source, but for, main, for uh, contributing, not for maintaining. I think there's a lot of good CRMs like Octobox, which is more of like, if you are the maintainer, you can get all your notification issues. But there's no of like, hey, I think of a good idea, let me find it. So I built this, Project and it was based off this, this guy Gucci Mane, so he's a he's a rapper based out of Atlanta. Um, he's the godfather of trap music. So if you're into mumble rap, which is like uh, that's like the rap of today. Um, if you aren't familiar with Gucci Mane, there's also some French rappers. Um, uh, Damso is actually Belgian, but he's thrown into French rap because fr French rap is literally a big thing. So if you don't listen to rap, uh, French rap is actually really big. Um, so anybody around France gets thrown into French rap. Uh, and that's like how you can find them. Uh, but these are two trap uh, artists as well, so you can definitely check them out. Uh, I don't condone the lyrics because I don't even know what they're saying, to be honest. Uh, but I mentioned Gucci Mane because Gucci Mane is also uh, a very prevalent sampler, too, as well. Uh, he sampled a song by Minnie Ripperton, uh, which is, was popularized by South Park, of all places. So it's like the song where Cartman was singing, uh, Loving you is easy because you're beautiful. Anyway, Gucci Mane samples that. Nice. <laughs> Someone's listening to rap in front. All right. But I, I bring this up because Gucci Mane had this, this, this thought uh, when he had this interview. It was on Tumblr, uh, now on YouTube. And someone was asking about, what do you think about all these up-and-coming rappers? Um, and he, was, he said that if you don't got sauce, then you lost. Uh, and they were talking about literally like sauce as in how good you are and how, how, how you can approach the things. And when I think of open source, I think of being lost. Like I never knew where to start. So I created an open source project to manage your open source project. And I called it open sauced. Uh, this is the actual TLD. Um, I don't recommend using it because I made this like a year and a half ago and I haven't supported it in about a year. Um, but it was a fun project to learn GraphQL. That's literally the purpose of the entire project. It's, I never got to the point where you could actually use it. Hopefully in uh, the next couple weeks, I can probably make this a little more usable uh, while I take some time off. But I literally created this project so I could save and take notes on different open source projects. Um, and it was really because I wanted to learn GraphQL. So I'm just reiterating exactly, exactly what I said. 
Um, if you're into infrastructure and boxes, this is exact, exactly what I did. Um, I do a lot of JavaScript, so I built a React app. This is all React. And I took the, I have no backend. The backend, my entire backend is GitHub's GraphQL API. And I basically use um, a fetching map because, uh, actually, I just, actually am using Node fetch because at the time, nothing else existed that was good. So I'm just using um, fetch and using GraphQL and presenting on open source. I'm also using Prisma to save notes. Um, I'm actually going to change this to saving and gist. Uh, I have an open issue about that. So hopefully in the next couple weeks I'll tinker with it. Again, this is mainly for me to scratch an itch, not for you to buy my product. So this is not an announcement or anything. But um, I successfully, uh, successfully sampled GitHub uh, to build my GraphQL uh, integration. And... So I honestly, I think that GitHub is a really good platform for you to try out GraphQL. Uh, who's using GraphQL in production as of today? So just everybody in the front, nobody in the back. Uh, that's, that's fine because I think you have that opportunity and I think um, GitHub's GraphQL API is being heavily used. Um, as mentioned this morning, we had like half a million uh, requests that are happening daily. Um, on top of that, we have 200 plus contributors. So everybody in GitHub is actually using GitHub, uh, GitHub's GraphQL API. So we're kind of hammering it pretty hard. Uh, but we'd love for you guys to try it out and give us feedback. Again, I, I call myself Queen B because I want to hear your feedback. Um, and I also wanted to make, make a quick mention. I'll just make a, a, a brief mention that I gave a talk about wrappers. Uh, unlike the talk I'm giving right now, it was about getting started with GraphQL. So there's a blog post on GraphQL.org about wrapping your REST API to use GraphQL. So this is actually my initial introduction at my pre previous company is actually take my REST API and wrap it. And it basically looks like this. So I have a front end and I have a back end. In the middle, I have a GraphQL gateway, uh, very similar to Amplify or anything like that. You can wrap existing REST stuff. Um, it's way more of a common practice today. It wasn't when I first was tinkering with GraphQL two years, two years ago. But I was able to sample REST in my GraphQL. So a lot of you are sitting here, it's like, ah, I have a REST API and I have an infrastructure team or a CTO our manager is like, no, we're not doing that thing. How about you just keep shipping features? And I was actually in that position. I could not take time off or take a week to do this. So I took a lunch on Friday and I built this. And I think you guys all, I think you could probably build it faster because now we have way more tools to do this today. But I also wanted to mention that the, in, the exact opposite of is actually happening at GitHub. So GitHub is a REST API. We're actually using GraphQL now. So we're powering everything through GraphQL Ruby to power our REST API. So a lot of the stuff that you're using in the REST API will actually be powered by GraphQL. Did I blow your mind at all? So we're, we're pretty much sold on GraphQL and we're, we're pushing, hopefully helping push the, the industry forward and hopefully if you guys have questions about that. Uh, but I did want to make a quick point about REST versus GraphQL. Uh, it's very similar to the East Coast, West Coast and the wrapping, the reason why I brought it up. I think that this is wrong. Like I did, if you're looking at REST versus GraphQL, I think you're approaching it way different. You're approaching it uh, with, the, uh, with a different lens that you shouldn't be using. Uh, I'm of the opinion that it should be REST plus GraphQL. So if you have a REST API, use your REST API. If you have a reason to use GraphQL, add GraphQL. And check off the boxes, the wins. So rather than racing to use the hottest, and newest, and the greatest thing, let's solve it the right way for the first time. So that way we have to come back next year and be like, by the way, schema stitching, let's not do that. Which literally happened. So let's... Let's just use what's good, and let's go ahead and do a talk like this. Maybe next year we can have more people on stage talking about how they got a bunch of different wins through GraphQL and how we sort of solved it um, incrementally rather than we RM-RF everything and start it over. Don't do that. So I also want to mention that GitHub REST API is not going anywhere. Uh, and this, it's not going anywhere because we, we have a lot of people who are supporting the GitHub um, they're using the REST API, so we want to help support all those integrators that are using the legacy system. Um, so keep that in mind. So I wanted to take a, a brief moment and like sort of a side trip into GitHub apps. So who's ever heard of a GitHub app? Handful of us. Uh, There's a good chance you're probably using one, even though you're not really sure what it was. But GitHub apps are a better way for interacting with our API. So you can curl. All of our documentation actually has curls. Um, right in the documentation to kind of show you like what how to sort of interact with API. Um, one of our developers actually a couple summers ago actually built this product called Probot. It's an open source project to interact with the GitHub API. It's a better experience. It's really to improve your developer experience, which is literally my original title of this talk. 
and it's really focused around automating workflows. So every day we're using GitHub. Uh, a lot of us rose our hand when I asked. But there's like an action that we do. So like once a week, you want to review pull requests, right? Or hopefully more than once a week if you have a bigger team. But every day, someone should like review something or someone should open an issue on something or so every two weeks we should have a sprint and open up some issues and plan what we're doing in the next week. Like we do this all the time. It's a consistent basis. Uh, so Probot basically can take those interactions on GitHub that happen all the time um, and you can actually fix those interactions. So for example, every time someone opens up a new issue on an open source project, you can create a GitHub app to say, hey, welcome to this project. Thanks for opening this issue. By the way, please read the contributing guidelines and also click, click on the CLA to prove that you will let us use your code. Like that's that's magical. It's something that should be happening. It should, I quite honestly, should be a feature of GitHub. But we aren't really focused on these niche things at the moment. Uh, I wouldn't even say this is niche. This is a big thing. Uh, but we don't we don't want to solve a problem to solve it for one person. We want to solve it for the masses. So at the moment, you can actually solve this problem for your use case by building a GitHub app. Another example is pull reminders. Anybody using pull reminders at all? Nice. So this was built by one developer in Chicago. Um, he was a CTO at a startup. And he constantly had to, to, the constant on his one-on-ones, constantly they would always say, hey, every time I have a pull request, like Johnny or Sally never looks at my PR. Like they could be open for a full week and no one wants to look, like, look at my PR. And so then you create, we create this like system where, okay, when you open a PR, just go to Slack and pop it in there and at mention somebody. Well, why, why would you do that when you spent all that time writing code? Like let the robots do that. So every time you open a pull request, you can actually add reviewers to your PR. You can actually add reviewers to sort of round robin, uh, basically randomly pick someone for you to review your pull request. Like, why not have the robots? Like, you know you have 10 people on the team or you have five people on the team and they should be reviewing code. Like, make this trivial, make it easier for someone to do this. And that's what Pull Reminders is. It's a product that's free for open source. Uh, you can install it directly onto your repo. Uh, and Avi did this by using the previous mentioned Probot. Uh, by literally, it's a node, I, I didn't actually mention this, but it's a, it's a node app. Um, and it's got a create probot app, so it's very similar to create React app if you use React. Um, you can just use command line and scaffold and a new uh, GitHub app to do something very trivial for you. And just write um, maybe seven, ten lines of JavaScript code to do that. So we're going to review pull requests once a day. Let's make that a thing that happens all the time. Like we do this with linters already. Like we're we're big in the ESLint in the JavaScript world. Like we have Ruby. Uh, Rubocop for the Ruby world. We've got all these other ones to sort of lint our code for us and like take that discussion out, we'll give it to the robots to make the decision. Uh, we should be doing the same thing for a lot of different things that we're doing. So at the end of the day, I talked about giving better hooks. Uh, Probot just listens to those hooks. So every time you make an, an event on GitHub, uh, you can actually create a Probot app based on that. Um, I think even a better uh, this, uh, subtext is actually take action on the GitHub API. Like we literally... Uh, you can actually build a GitHub action as well. Um, I don't know actions as well to be able to explain them. Um, actually, I do know them well. I just haven't built one to mirror exactly what my probot is. But I just want to mention that also every probot app can be a GitHub action. So if you do have access to the beta, uh, you can actually do that. Um, the example of the probot app that I, give, that I gave every time you open an issue, uh, it automatically opens up a need response. So this is one of our interns actually built this bot. Actually, they actually built a handful of bots. Uh, the past two summers because they were interned for the past few summers. And they're super trivial. Again, 10 lines of JavaScript to build something that's very useful for a number of open source projects they're using today. I uh, also want to mention that if you ever use OctoKit, it's a SDK um, in a number of different languages. The Probot actually uses the JavaScript one under the hood. So if you're familiar with OctoKit already because if you're using it for other projects, uh, Probot should be just as familiar because it's the same SDK to do it. Uh, and this is five lines of JavaScript for the previous slide. Those are the five lines of JavaScript that make that work. Uh, so you can launch this in a Lambda function. You can launch this into Google Cloud, Azure, um, and it just works for free. It is, it's an event that happens. Now, this is the GraphQL track. This is the GraphQL talk. just want to mention that though it is five more lines, uh, I think at the end of the day, it will be better. So if you have a long-standing Probot app or an app that you're going to be using uh, that's going to do multiple things, uh, this is how you would do GraphQL. So Probot actually has GraphQL out of the box for you. And this is how you would add it. So if you had GraphQL, uh, if you wanted to interact with the API and you're already on the GraphQL trick and you, uh, and you actually want to try this out, you can actually just literally take a picture, copy and paste, or type exactly what I said. Actually, I'll tweet the slides right after. And then you can check it out. Oh, nobody needs any water after me. 
here. It's like I, I was talking fine all day, and now my, my throat's all dry. You guys are stop looking at me. All right, so the GraphQL a API, uh, it provides an opportunity to find better interactions. And what I mean about that is I came from a company where we heavily were involved in the GitHub API. Uh, it was a company called Netlify, if you've heard of it. And the entire product was built on, like, on GitHub's API. That's pretty much the bread and butter of how the product works. And we had this massive file that basically recreated OctoKit um, for no reason. Like, we just did it for, because that's just the way we like to write code. We like to repeat everything everybody else has done. Anyway, I'll get off my soapbox for a moment. But with GraphQL, you don't have to match. So every single one of our functions inside of our, our, our um, API, our GitHub API.js, or GitHub API.rb, actually, what, which what it was, uh, mirrored exactly what GitHub was giving us as a REST endpoint. So every single REST endpoint that we needed was a function that sort of consumed and manipulated data and did some string concatenation to sort of present that beautifully. With GraphQL, you can create one query to do one thing. So I have a query that basically takes all contributors for every repo of the organization and give that to me in a string, or sorry, in an array, rather. I don't know what I would do with the string of a ton of it, uh, a bunch of names, but anyway. So that's what this query is, and this is one query. Normally, this would be five different endpoints for me to hit organizations, hit repos, get different data, because dip depending on if you get the organization, organization or the repo, it gives you different data. So then you have to go there, and then you can, uh, if you want specific data on those repos that are in the organization, you have to hit the repo endpoint again based on that repo ID. So it's it's not the best uh, approach, not the best developer experience, but if I'm doing one thing and my app is doing one thing really great, one query should be enough, and then I can sort of leverage some other tooling to sort of do caching and uh, do a lot of stuff that doesn't get, that I might not handle or I might invalidate caching or not. Um, but that's your story. So the, I would also mention that GitHub API is constantly getting new interactions, so you should definitely reach out if there's something that's missing, uh, if you're trying to build your product on the GraphQL API. Uh, let me know. I could be the, the sort of liaison between GitHub. We also do have a forum that you can also check out. Speaking of checks, uh, we have this new thing called the Checks API. So I'm launching it from this stage to the, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, we launched it actually last summer. Um, and it's in, it's technically a developer preview still. And so the Checks API, is a, it's another way for, to give sophisticated feedback. So a lot of us are already familiar with the little, the box in the PR. It's a status commit uh, box. Kind of tells us exactly what's happening. Uh, if we open up a PR, sometimes Travis will tell us if our, our test pass or fail. Speaking of which, here's Travis. So this is a commit status. Uh, with, the checks, with the checks API, we get way more feedback. So a lot of times you'll have to go to Travis to see the details of what, what happened if it failed, get like more details of like the line number, and then take that back to GitHub or take that back to your, your Vim or your, your VS Code. Um, with checks API, we bring that feedback directly to GitHub. So something you're constantly always looking up uh, going back outside of the github.com, we actually bring that through in the checks API. So what I did is I created a repo, and I added a GitHub app, which is using the checks API. And I, so Beyonce has a song called Check On It. Uh, you probably haven't heard of it because it was um, on the soundtrack of Pink Panther, which is a movie no one saw. Um, but it was a great song. So I took those lyrics, and I opened up a PR based on a markdown file. And I installed this GitHub uh, Linter Alex app, one, which one of my colleagues actually made. <coughs> and what Alex is doing is actually creating a, a new tab on our PR. So there's a tab here called Checks. And here you can actually see details based on what's happening within um, the code that I actually created. Sorry, code's a stretch. It's all actually just words. So it's a markdown file. And here at Linter Alex actually takes your the stuff that you're submitted, and it tells you whether or not your the code, or sorry, the words that you've created is, has in, insensitive language. So, for example, it's not really politically correct to say boy or girl um, when describing somebody. It might be better to say like child or they or them. So what happens in Beyonce's lyrics is that she's using the word girl, and it's su suggesting the word kid instead. I know it's kind of hard to read, but trust me, that's what it says. And the cool thing about that is you can actually, actually click through exactly what that annotation is, and you can actually see it the line. So as of a couple months ago, you can actually suggest changes. So once you've hit that check and you click through, you can suggest to change that. And then your colleague or yourself can accept those changes directly within GitHub. So again, like GitHub is not trying to take over your entire workflow, but we're trying to make your workflow better. So if you want to enhance it, Checks API is the way to do it. And I also want to mention that you can build this with GraphQL as well. So check out our documentation. I won't go line by line about that. I also want to mention that GraphQL Doctor was mentioned earlier this morning. 
in the previous talk to GitHub app. So everything I talked about so far is actually you can build yourself. Now I want to mention that GitHub's GraphQL Doctor is not open source. Uh, we wanted to solve a problem for our use case, so we haven't really we haven't open sourced this. But my other colleague, uh, Marc Andre Giroux, um, French Canadian guy, he gave a talk about GraphQL Doctor, and three weeks later, someone reverse engineered exactly what we did, and they built it themselves. So there's an open source version of GraphQL Doctor that's not ours, uh, that's almost similar that you can use yourself. So if you have a project that uses GraphQL, um, maybe support that open source project and see if it's good for you. Uh, also mentioning Checks API is a developer preview. It still is. We've got the notification on that. Um, so well, if you want to use this as a before, you'll have to accept, you have to add a header. Check the documentation. It looks like this. But the cool thing is that we have GraphQL Playground, so if you do want to test it out, but you don't want to build a project, uh, you can actually just add your the API.com slash GraphQL uh, into there. Just make sure you bring your token with you, so you need to create a token. We explain this all in the documentation, so check it out. And then you can check out checks. So I said all this, and I went through all those hip-hop references, because I, I believe you can literally sample GraphQL. Like, if you are on the fence, or you're not sure, or you just learned about it this today, um, you could actually go ahead and do that with GitHub data with your account. So I would say use GraphQL and get sampling. Go to this URL. Um, this has all the documentation. Our GraphQL API is actually version 4 of our API. So just uh, in case you weren't aware or you weren't following along a couple of years ago, uh, that's, that's the URL, so check it out. And this is me on Twitter, BWO. Thank you very much. <laughs>